Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show across the nation. The phone number 877 877- nine seven three seven four two five if you want to be on the program and you know what i didn't even i um, i apologize uh we have an affiliate change it's kind of a big deal for us here wdbo down in orlando florida god bless them uh i am now noon to three on wdbo if you're wondering um who i am well you know i have been on in the evening and I'm delighted to be with you guys. I got family. My Uncle Leaf, yes, my Uncle Leaf Erickson lives down in Winter Park. Uh, we get down there every once in a while, and it's just great to be on with you guys live now on 107.3 FM, 580 AM, Orlando's News Talk, WDBO. Thank you for putting me live. Now, I move on. I got stuff to talk about. We want to talk about Jill Biden. Because, well, she kind of put her foot in her mouth yesterday. And I, I got to set this up for you. You, you got to understand this one. She went to an event that was called a Latinx inclusion event. And I got to spell it for you. Latinx, Latinx, L-A-T-I-N-X. And then it was spelled this way. I-N-C-L-U-X. I-O-N. Latinx inclusion. Now, the group is a uh, Washington, D.C. nonprofit. It holds a yearly event. It focuses on housing, health, racial equality. It's a good group of progressives, not all Hispanic. What's so notable about it is that on the group's primary website, they focus on Latino and Hispanic. But here, when they invite the white folks, it's Latinx. And Jill Biden Jill, not Joe, being clear here, Jill kind of stepped in it. Let's roll the tape. But we can't get those things on our own. Raul helped build this organization with the understanding that the diversity of this community, as distinct as the Bogodas of the Bronx, as beautiful as the blossoms of Miami, and as unique as the breakfast tacos here in San Antonio, <laughs> is your strength. Um, first of all, let, let's just focus on the bogadas, bodega. Y'all, I'm part Cajun, part Sweden, Swedish from South Louisiana, living in Georgia. And even I know it's called a bodega. How did she go to, to Bogota? I mean, maybe she thought it was Colombian or something, and she was trying to make a play on South. I have no idea. A Bogota in in Brooklyn as opposed to a bodega. Bodega. My God. I'm, I, I thought people were making that part up at first, but no, no. The doctor, Mrs. Dr. Jill Biden, smartest woman on planet Earth, called it a bogada. Uh, but the, the real outrage came <laughs> when she compared Hispanic people to tacos. To tacos. Again, uh, one more time, let's roll the audio. But we can't get those things on our own. Raul helped build this organization with the understanding that the diversity of this community, as distinct as the Bogodas of the Bronx, as beautiful as the blossoms of Miami, and as unique as the breakfast tacos here in San Antonio, she was going for the alliteration, the, the Bogadas of, of Br- the Bronx, not Brooklyn. The Blossoms of Miami, the breakfast time. Well, okay, hey, hey, team, what works? What works? 
Uh, not the boats of the canal in San Antonio. No, no. Let, let's let's not go with the boats. Um, um, uh, the 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 beautiful sunrise over San Antonio. Nope, no. We we can't go. Le, le, breakfast tacos. I got it. Breakfast tacos. Holy moly! The, <laughs> the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. There is a National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and they have released a statement. Jill Biden used the phrase the, as distinct as the bodegas, or I'm sorry, the bogades of the Bronx, as beautiful as the blossoms of Miami, as unique as the breakfast tacos here in San Antonio. The National Association of Hispanic Journalists, this is the tweet, encourages the First Lady and her communications team to take time to better understand the complexities of our people and communities. We are not tacos. I feel like I should say, we are not tacos. Our heritage as Latinos is shaped by various diasporas, diasporas, cultures, and food traditions do not reduce us to stereotypes. And, you know, if you pay attention to this, um, the bodegas in the Bronx, pretty diverse ethnic background, even among the Hispanic community, the Blossoms, Miami, there's a Cuban community there, there's a Puerto Rican community there, there's a Venezuelan and a Colombian, but the the breakfast tacos of San Antonio, that was a bit of a reach. Somebody should probably be fired on her staff that she went along with it. Dr. Mrs. Jill Biden went along with that. Um, I, uh, you know, if she's so offended by people not calling her doctor, you would think she would kind of understand people might just be a little offended when you call them a taco. Apparently Latinx is white progressive speak for tacos. Now I'm hungry. Aren't you hungry? There's a larger issue here. And this is actually the important one. If you go back to 2012, with Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney in Iowa, you begin to see in Western Iowa, the blue collar non-college educated communities that had gone for Barack Obama in 2008, they were beginning to vote more and more Republican in 2012 and then 14, 16, 18, and then 20, it began to be more widespread. You began to see it as early as 2010. It really didn't become manifest until 2016 and and has held up ever since, even into 2018 and 2020. But you didn't see it at first. It was kind of an, an anomaly. In the same way in 2016, you began to see the Southern uh, border counties of Colorado that were majority Hispanic. The Rio Grande Valley counties in South Texas, even down in Florida, not not the I-4 corridor that's kind of become moving, if anything, towards the Democrats a little bit, but, but those predominantly Hispanic communities down in South Florida, they were starting to vote Republican at rates they hadn't been in the past. And nobody really noticed it at first. Nobody really paid attention at first. Because it it seemed like an anomaly. It was a weird thing. Hillary Clinton, terrible candidate. Nobody liked her. But it's held up and it's grown and it's become more manifest. There really is a shift going. And part of the shift is, is, you know what you call Hispanic people in this country? You might want to sit down for this one. Do you know what you call a Hispanic person in this country? Mom. Dad. Doctor. Lawyer, plumber, janitor, lawn care, landscaper, fast food worker, accountant, American. And they're not Hispanic. They're not Latino. They're Venezuelan. They're Colombian. They're Argentinian. They're Puerto Rican. They're Peruvian. They're Chilean. They're Guatemalan. They're Nicaraguan. They're Honduran. They're Mexican. They're Panamanian. It's a diverse group of people. 
to boil them down as tacos. The taco is uniquely Mexican, and essentially that's what it reads as is, is, oh, oh, you're saying they're all like the Mexicans. Well, no, they're not. The bodegas at least are culturally diverse. The blossoms of Miami, you can kind of get there, but the, the breakfast tacos of San Antonio, they're pretty specifically Mexican in origin. And it just, it it didn't work. And this is the problem for the Democrats. They call them Latinx, a word that you cannot say in the Spanish language. It's impossible to form it in the Spanish language. And the white people go along with it. You narrow them down to be breakfast tacos. This is a problem that's been simmering for a while. It's been simmering around the country for a while. And you see it made manifest plain as day in places like the southern counties of Colorado that are predominantly Hispanic, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, you see it in Arizona, you see it in New Mexico even, where the Democrats thought they had drawn some safe Democratic seats and it looks like the Republicans may win some. The Hispanic, the Latino community, call it whichever one you want, most in the that community say Hispanic. It's the white people, the people in South Los Angeles and in Southern California say Latino, then that's what is pervasive within the Democratic Party there. But most people would say in the vernacular Hispanic, they flip back and forth, but none of them say Latinx. And all of them know we're not talking about Mexicans here. We're talking about Mexicans some, but we're talking about a bunch of other countries too. And they all have unique stories. And they all have unique backgrounds and they all have unique histories, but now they are Americans and they want to be treated as an American and they care about border security and they care about crime and they care about education. And they fled many of them socialist dictatorships or collapsed kleptocracies and they've come to the United States for a better living. And what do they have here? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the squad, and Nancy Pelosi wanting to impose on them the same economic regimes they fled from to get here for a better life. They want to impose on them a cultural progressivism that's anathema to their deep-seated faith that got them through the wilds, deserts, and jungles of Central America on foot to get here in some cases, and in other cases by their sweat and brow and, and the money they saved to get on a plane to come here, and the Democrats want to punish them all, punish their success. They've heard that rhetoric before. It's the rhetoric they fled from, and that's why there's a massive cultural shift underway to the GOP. These people aren't breakfast tacos, Jill Biden. They're American citizens. Welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here. You know, you can follow me on social media at EW Erickson, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. You should subscribe to my YouTube page. We put up long form videos and short form videos from the show. I mean, Instagram, you know, Instagram is really where you should follow me. Instagram where I put up all my cooking pictures and life pictures. You know, I got to leave after today. I'm going to be gone the next couple of days because I got a lot of speaking engagements out West and I'll be putting up pictures, I'm sure. But nonetheless, E-W-E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N. Follow me on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Um, a, a personal note for you all. Um, I'm sure you may have seen the images being released from the um, James Webb Space Telescope. They released the first one yesterday. They've released the others now, and my gosh. Wow. I, 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 I'm, I don't even know how to describe what I'm seeing. You know, what comes to mind is that hymn, um, oh, uh, How Great Thou Art, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. I, I'm, I, it, it, y'all, it, it's, I'm at a loss for words by the beauty of this the, the, and, and the science of it. And you notice they're all saying the James Webb telescope, and, and they went through that whole big woke thing where the telescope needed to be renamed. It needed to be canceled because J, uh, James Webb was a conservative who supposedly kept gays out of NASA at the behest of the government. Actually, it was official government policy that he was uh, forced to impose at the time. 
And now we see this stuff and nobody cares. These pictures are spectacular. A look back in time, if you will. I mean, the, the very first one they released was a, a picture of a thousand uh, galaxies. And they said, if you held a grain of sand between your fingers and stretched your arm out as far as you could go, that grain of sand would represent the s- sky, the size of the sky they were looking at. And there were that many galaxies. It's just awe inspiring. You know, one of the things that makes the Judeo Christian faith real to me is Genesis was written by Moses. Now, I realize a bunch of academic liberals dispute this, but it's been orthodoxy for thousands of years that Moses wrote it. And we know now, of course, through archaeological evidence, that uh, originally people said, well, the these the um, the Pentateuch, the Septuagint, the original five books of the Bible, that they were um, – that they came from uh, the 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 exile in Babylon, and then we had archaeological evidence show no no the, these things they they knew about it before then, uh, they were using it before then, and in Genesis it, Moses is writing and, and uh, let's say it was let's just, for the sake of argument it, it was written later, but it was written into a world of polytheists where everything was a god every every star in the sky was a god. Um, everybody was a God. And yet here comes Moses writing this and says, nope, there's one God. And these things in the sky, they're just objects. They're not to be worshiped, only worship God. The stars, the moon, the sun, they're just objects in the sky. Every other religion thousands of years ago, we're talking 5,000 years ago now, every other religion believed they were gods, believed the sun was a god, believed the moon was a god, believed the stars were gods. And here comes Moses all alone on planet Earth and says, nope, these are not. God himself tells me these are objects he put in the sky. They're not to be worshiped. But you can see why. You can see why people worshiped them. Because they're mesmerizing. They twinkle at night. They move across the sky. And wonder of wonders, when you have a telescope and you can look at them further, you see more detail and they're even more glorious than you imagine. So I, and this is why you should follow me on Instagram at E.W. Erickson. I like astrophotography. I take pictures. I get up at two in the morning. I'm not very good at it. I have friends who are really amazing at it. I have a great telescope. I attach my camera to it, and I get some amazing pictures. The Orion Nebula, easy to shoot, easy to take a picture of. I adore taking pictures of it, and it's just mesmerizing to look and see that that is there, and you can see it through a telescope and take a picture of it, and it's real. The wonders never cease. I just... I mean, the, these pictures do nothing but strengthen my faith. It's just incredible to see the wonders of God. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. I So I, I got to, you know, I, I didn't mean to do this. I, I'm on WOKV in Jacksonville, Florida in delay, but WDBO in Orlando has me live. Delighted to be with you guys. And I got to talk about your governor down in Florida. So, I, you know, I, I've actually, of, of all the people who are probably running in 2024, let's see, I've met Donald Trump, know him. I'm friends with Mike Pence. I'm friends with Tom Cotton. I'm friends with Ted Cruz. I'm friends with Marco Rubio. I'm friends with Nikki Haley. I, I know Tim Scott. I wouldn't say we're friends. Same with Josh Hawley, who may run. I uh, don't really know Christy Nome uh, if she were to run. Uh, the, but the one guy I've never met, out of all these people, I've met all of them. The only one I have never met is Ron DeSantis. I've never met the guy. Um, and I am continually amazed with the way he's navigating politics right now. So he's up for re-election this year. Those of you outside of Florida, I'm sure you all know as well, he, he's on the ballot this year. Um. He's got two terrible opponents. One of them is is Charlie Crist. My gosh, what a terrible opportunist that guy is. Uh, the original orange man. And DeSantis has just played all his cards right. And one of the things that, that you may miss in the national media coverage of DeSantis is that DeSantis, by and large, 
has played everything uh, just highly competently when it comes to COVID, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to education. He's picked positions that a majority of Floridians tend to support. And then he throws in some culture war issues that really resonate with the Republican base that don't turn off independent voters and in some cases actually are supported by Democratic voters. And the national media loses their business on it. And in them losing their business on it, it actually helps DeSantis down in Florida. DeSantis, this guy is a master politician, Ron DeSantis. I am impressed with his acumen. And you know, you occasionally get bitter staffers who have left him and said, oh, he's difficult to work with. He probably is. He's probably a demanding boss. Uh, I, 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 I knew some people who worked for him in Congress who said he was a pretty demanding boss. They liked him, but he knew what he wanted. And he seems that way in Florida. And that's not a bad thing. It's nice to have a guy who is, one, ideologically grounded, two, very competent in the facts of the matter, and three, runs circles around the press. In fact, uh, there, there was a, a um, story I saw yesterday in Wisconsin. The Trump voters in several towns in Wisconsin, they've all moved on to DeSantis. It is no surprise then that the national media is beginning to run their hit jobs on Ron DeSantis. In fact, here's one. This one kind of blows my mind. Uh, Ron DeSantis would kill democracy slowly and methodologically. Whether he's as bad as Trump isn't the question. This is from Jonathan Chait at the New York Magazine. Let me read you some of this. During the Donald Trump era, democracy itself has become the preeminent question of American politics. Yet Trump himself has played a paradoxical role in this development. While his overtly authoritarian personality brought the democracy question to the fore, the sheer grossness of his behavior also served to blot out the deeper ideological causes of the rift. As Trump eventually fades from the scene, perhaps overtaken by Ron DeSantis, the democracy question far from disappearing, might instead sharpen. A glimpse into this future came recently when I proposed on Twitter that DeSantis is a deeply authoritarian figure. The incredulity and rage of the conservative response this summoned was captured by a Fox News story headline, New York Magazine writer, wrecked for calling DeSantis a more competent authoritarian than Trump hysterical. What's revealing about this episode is how it has put on display the belief on the right that to call DeSantis a threat to democracy is not only wrong, but self-evidently absurd. Now, you need to know something about Jonathan Jate, who writes this piece. Back in 2015, Jonathan Jate informed America not to worry about Donald Trump. The real authoritarian threats to America were guys named Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. America should fear them, not Donald Trump. That is the same guy then who said those things now says Ron DeSantis is an authoritarian threat to American democracy. Right. Here, let, let's just let's cut to the chase here. Here's what's going on. This is all about 2024. They got to rough up DeSantis in 2022 to begin to build a record for 2024. This is a point I have made before. This is broken record time. I'm going to say it again because I think this is absolutely relevant. And I need to know, I need you to know going into this, that this is not an endorsement. I don't even know the guy. I've never met the guy. I've never talked to Ron DeSantis. I know and am friends with a number of the people who will run in 2024. I am very good friends with some of them. Nikki Haley and Mike Pence, I have known for a very long time. They are very good people and very good friends. And so this is an endorsement. This is just my observation of where things are. Do not hear this as an endorsement. But again, I, I've said this before. This goes back to the year 1998. I know some of you weren't born then. Some of you don't want to remember 1998. But I was a young guy developing a love for politics. And in 1998, 
The Republicans were headed into a, a midterm that turned out not to be as good for them as they had thought. Would wind up ending Newt Gingrich's speakership. And the Republicans were like, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And there was a movement to say, you know what? Jack Kemp is the man. Jack Kemp, former congressman, worked for Ronald Reagan. He's the guy. He was Reagan's guy. He was Bob Dole's guy. He's the guy conservatives want. We need to go to Kemp. And a lot of the Republican Party said, Kemp's kind of old. We need fresh blood. We need something else. There's this guy down in Texas. He's got a famous last name. His dad's pretty famous. His dad's a former president. But this guy is a man in his own right, and he's a pretty good conservative, too unlike his dad. That's what they said in 98. So look at this guy. If he wins re-election, he'll be the first major Republican political force in Texas. Texas is the second most populous state. It's, it's just, it's exploding in size and growth and power in the Electoral College. I guess it was third at the time uh, or something in there. And it's like, we could we could we could make a base of operations in Texas, get those electoral college votes, have a conservative guy who picks up Hispanic votes. This this makes sense. And by ninety nine it picked up steam. And you had the Republican Party. There were some brilliant Republican candidates out there. There was Phil Graham of Texas out there. There was Jack Kemp. There was Steve Forbes. There was Alan Keyes at the time, I believe. There was John McCain. There were a lot of Republicans looking at, I'm going to run. And ultimately, Orrin Hatch as well was one of the guys from, from Utah, the senator from Utah. And ultimately, pretty much the entire Republican Party consolidated behind George W. Bush, and it pissed off John McCain, and he decided he was going to run because the party shouldn't consolidate. And he lost. And he played into the media's hands, and he said all the things the media loved, and John McCain became the maverick darling, and it didn't matter. He couldn't stop Bush. And Bush won. And Bush won the Electoral College. He did not win the popular vote against Al Gore. Came close, lost, uh, got 533 more votes than Al Gore did in Florida. Every vote mattered. And he became president of the United States. And I got to tell you, whether you like him now or not, they're, they're, the, the parties have kind of uh, gone in opposite directions on Bush's legacy. I'm telling you, George Bush is the man you wanted in the White House on 9 11. A man grounded in faith. A man who, if he was thrown out of office, would have been just fine. He was grounded in faith. He had already battled his demons earlier in life. He was the man with the character and the strength we needed in 9-11. God put him there for a purpose. Now, the fallout from 9-11 and what he did with Iraq and stuff, where we're still, I mean, the, the whirlwind is still being reaped over that stuff. Don't necessarily agree with everything he did, but he was the guy we wanted there on 9-11. And the nation rallied to him. DeSantis right now, it kind of feels like that to me. Because if you go back to 1998, 1999, what you find is a series of opportunistic hit jobs about George W. Bush. The national media was digging into the opposition on George W. Bush at the time. They were attacking him for all sorts of deals in Texas. They were attacking him for the death penalty in Texas and the rate of executions in Texas. They were attacking him for racial disparities in Texas. They were attacking him for school funding in Texas. They were attacking Bush for all sorts of things in Texas at the time, and they were doing so not for 1998, but for the year 2000. And it didn't matter. Republicans consolidated behind him. He won easily his reelection in 1998. And he went on to lock up the Republican Party nomination in the year 2000, became president of the United States. This reminds me of that, what's going on with DeSantis right now. The national press and the Democrats are still scared to death of him. They see him as the competition. They want to take him out now. They are doing everything they can, including the hysteria about authoritarianism and dysfunction and the end of democracy. And, and, and you know, he's, he's like Trump, but competent. That makes him more dangerous. Best thing to happen to Donald Trump is to have Ron DeSantis. His reputation will be rehabilitated immediately because DeSantis will be the new big bad. It's kind of like all of a sudden, I mean, Romney and McCain and Bush are like the hero now compared to Trump, orange man, bad sort of stuff from the media. This is the media nationally scared to death of this guy 
Because look at the landscape. You have a fractured Democratic Party fracturing before our eyes and a Republican Party beginning to consolidate in 2022 for a race that's not even until 2024. If I was a Democrat, I'd be a little fretful, too. If I was one of the other Republicans, I'd be trying to rough up DeSantis, too, try to knock him off his game, make him look a little vulnerable, and they're not. People look like they're consolidating. Now, one of the groups that's out there helping the Republican Party navigate through 2022, not even in 2024 yet, is Patriot Mobile. They are a cell phone provider and a good one at that, really good cell phone provider. You can use Patriot Mobile and they use the same cell towers everybody else uses. So you're not going to get bad service. I mean, I got a phone uh, and I won't tell you what provider I'm with, but I got two lines. One's Patriot Mobile, one's another one of the big name carriers. And I can get Patriot Mobile in rural parts of Georgia that the other phone just doesn't get a signal with. It's that good. And you can carry your own phone number over to it. You can get a new phone number if you want, uh, You can, but you can port over your existing number and you get great discounts. They're committed to the conservative cause. They give a portion of their profits to the cause and they give great discounts to people like you. Um, so what you can do is go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric, patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K, or you can call them 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. You get free activation with my name. So I've done a series of interviews in the last few days about all the Herschel Walker stuff. His campaign's kind of fallen apart. They bring in new people from Washington to, to try to revitalize his campaign. Look, I still think the guy can win. I just think that they're going to have to pour a lot of money into do it. But man, I read this Eugene Robinson piece from yesterday. It's, supposed to, like, it's actually supposed to be, it's a live piece for today's paper in the Washington Post. It was put up about five o'clock yesterday. Let me read you the headline. It makes me want to go all out for Herschel Walker. If Herschel Walker wins in Georgia, America will have lost its mind. It's not yet clear who will have the weirdest and most unfit Republican Senate candidate in November. But my early pick is Herschel Walker in Georgia. If he wins, and he could, the nation has truly lost its mind. The flashing red lights and blaring sirens are not just about the former football star's myriad lies and stunning hypocrisy. That kind of stuff doesn't necessarily trouble Republican voters in the least, given their continued devotion to Donald Trump, who counts Walker as a longtime friend. It's Walker's combination of utter ignorance and total confidence, which challenges even that of the former president. Or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Kamala Harris. I mean, this is a, a, a hit job on Herschel Walker by Eugene Robinson, the progressive uh, correspondent for the Washington Post. Hates Walker, thinks terribly of Walker, thinks Walker should lose. But I, just a couple of things here. A couple of things to notice. The flashing red lights and blaring sirens are not just about the former football stars, myriad lies and stunning hypocrisy. That is every politician ever. Eugene Robinson is an apologist for all of the Democrats who lie and are hypocrites. He doesn't care about them, and yet he wants to condemn Republicans. He demands precision and consistency from his opponents where he himself has none. That in and of itself is pretty telling. The other issue here that I find very notable is that he's going after Walker's utter ignorance and total confidence. Has he not seen some of the Democratic candidates out there? I mean, the reality is uh, what he's doing is trying to embarrass people into not voting for Walker. Makes me want to go all out for Walker, put a sign in my front yard for him that Eugene Robinson is as bothered as he is by this. Eugene Robinson has never met a Republican he wasn't embarrassed by. Eugene Robinson has never met a Republican he likes. Uh, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. And it, I, I just, I, it, it's, it's, it's nonsensical. I realize that I, I shouldn't even be wasting my time on this, but this is the Washington Post. Walker has his problems. But, you know, I, so I had an interview yesterday with Georgia Public Broadcasting. And I was explaining to the reporter that Herschel Walker can and very will probably win this race. I don't know that there are enough independent voters out there who will vote for Brian Kemp and for Raphael Warnock. 
I think you'll have uh, Warnock Abrams and you'll have Walker Kemp. And there are more people who are going to vote for Kemp that are going to vote for Abrams in Georgia. I don't think Abrams can win. And the fact that Abrams is running a campaign this time, trying to sound more moderate, and has literally run a campaign saying everything Brian Kemp has already done, I'm going to do. That is Stacey Abrams. For those of you all outside of Georgia, that is the entire Stacey Abrams campaign. It is here are all of these things I'm going to do. And it turns out every damn one of them is something Brian Kemp has already done, except she's going to spend twice as much. Does it tell us where she's going to get the money from? Tax increases. I think Herschel Walker can win. The problem, the amount of resources that are going to have to be spent to help Walker get across the finish line when another candidate probably would have an easier lift. That's my concern with Walker is the expenditures, not the ability of him to win. Now, I, I got, I, well, shouldn't say that. I do have some concerns about his ability to win, but I think he can pull it off. It's such a bad year for the Democrats. He's not really running against Raphael Warnock on the ballot, for sure. That's who he's running against. Same with all the other Republican and Democratic candidates around the country. But the reality is people are going to see that those Democrats are proxy votes for Joe Biden's campaign and Joe Biden's votes and Joe Biden's values, and they're going to be furious. They are going to come after these guys. So it doesn't really matter. And when you have the left, a guy like Eugene Robinson, Attacking a guy like Herschel Walker right now, it suggests even the Democrats kind of realize this. It suggests the Democrats are trying to use, the, oh, it's going to be so embarrassing, terribly embarrassing. There's there's no way you could possibly vote for this guy. You should be ashamed if you vote for Herschel Walker. No, no. People aren't going to be ashamed. People are going to go vote with gusto for a football player who they all loved, who says absolutely bizarre stuff on the campaign trail and who's going to lose a debate to Raphael Warnock. But it won't matter. What matters is Joe Biden's unpopularity.